so yeah, so today I'm just going to talk about the final loop. So where you, um, so locating where your electrodes are basically in the brain after you've gone through all of the previous pipelines. Um, so I'll first just very, Stephen kind of mentioned most of this, but I'll just very briefly over, overview how you get your initial uh, locations of electrodes in the brain. Um, so once you have your histology image, you then register it uh, to this common coordinate framework, which involves like warping and scaling different brain regions to match this template. Um, and if you've labeled your probe correctly, you should have a nice bright fluorescent track that you can then trace through the image stack to then reconstruct where your probe has been in 3D space. And then the final step is then to distribute your electrodes along this track. Um, so according to a known kind of geometry of electrodes, so in our case for the neuropixel probes, we always place the first electrode around 200 micrometers from the tip of the trace and then distribute them at kind of 20 micrometer intervals going up from there. So this gives you a first estimate of the XYZ coordinate of all of your electrodes um, in this kind of reference volume. And because we are in this common coordinate framework, we then can assign each uh, coordinate to a single voxel in this image stack, which has a brain region associated with it. So in this way, we can then infer which brain region each electrode has been or assigned to and allocated. Um, so on the left here, I just show an example of a coronal slice. Um, this is the Allen label volume, um, which where each kind of different color shows different brain regions um, in the Allen atlas. And then the black line shows the electrodes that have been distributed along the probe. Um, and we can also visualize this in a kind of 2D format where we just show the regions through which the electrodes traverse. Um, so we get an initial estimate of electrodes in this way, but this has a number of issues, so uncertainties. And so these come from the fact that obviously all subjects have different brain, uh, brain sizes and slightly different distribution of structures. And so when we scale them and walk them to match this template, the different regions will be scaled differently. So we need to somehow account for that. Um, when we're tracing the track, I think if you noticed in the last images, the kind of trace fluorescent bit can be quite broad and wide. So there are obviously inaccuracies when you're tracing and locating the probe tip. Uh, and this is also perpetuated by the fact that the dye can sometimes diffuse to nearby brain regions. So you have a bit of uncertainty in knowing exactly where your probe was located in the brain. Uh, so this is where we loop in the kind of electrophysiology that we've recorded on the probe. Um, so in this diagram on the left, I've shown just kind of the uh, electrode through the regions that it passed in the brain. And then on the right, I've got the firing rate that's seen on this probe. So as you can see, we have this kind of white region here, which corresponds to like an air gap in the brain. So what we would expect in the electrophysiology is for there to be a region of low firing rate where we don't have any neurons. So what we can do is use reference lines um, where we place them both on the histology image and also on our electrophysiology feature and then use these to basically shift our electrodes in the brain and relocate their position uh, in the brain and, and relocate all the electrode coordinates. Uh, so this shows a very idealistic case where all we've had to do is just apply an offset but in reality we want to be able to scale, um, scale uh, the distance between the electrodes along the probe both along the probe in total and also in specific brain regions that have been kind of warped or scaled more than others. Um, yeah, and so as, in order to do this, we've developed this alignment tool with, as part of the International Brain Laboratory. Um, and so it's available at this link. And I also give a demo. I thought that I first thought I'll go over a few of the common features that you should look out for when aligning electrodes that are very useful and quite robust across different subjects. Um, so the first is the white matter and ventricles. So in the Allen annotation, these are often, these are always um, indicated by these gray or white kind of regions. Um, and so in these regions, we expect there to be very low um, activity. And so this plot shows, uh, so this is the duration of the recording along the X. We have the uh, distance along the probe, and then these show individual kind of spikes with the color and size scaled according to the amplitude of the spikes. And what you can see is at the top and bottom of the probe where we have these white matter and ventricle regions, we have basically very little activity. Um, and then obviously this is represented also in the firing rate where we see kind of low regions, low region firing rates. Um, what we have found in some is that not when, especially when it's the white matter fibers, there are actually some neurons um, in these regions. 
But what's a useful thing to look at is actually the template or the waveform of the neurons. And what we sometimes see is that the polarity of the waveform is switched, which is indicative of kind of axonal spiking. So this is something also you can look out for. Um, so the other uh, useful feature is the dentate gyrus, which is in the hippocampus. Um, so this has a very high uh, power in low frequency, uh, in the low frequency LFP. So on this diagram here, I'm showing distance along the probe and then here I'm showing the power spectrum in the 30 to 80 hertz band. Um, and each of these individual rectangles basically shows one electrode, so it's kind of overlaid on the geometry of the neuropixel. Um, and so you can see we have this region that has a very high frequent, high power, sorry, um, LFP signal. And this corresponds to the dentate gyrus. That's a useful kind of thing to look, to align to. Um, similarly, the dentate gyrus has these two, it's often sandwiched by these two molecular layers where you expect to have little activity. And if we look at the firing rate across the session, we have these kind of two silent bands around. So those are useful kind of landmarks to use to, as alignment. Um, and finally, uh, another useful feature is the pyramidal cell layer. So these typically have um, high firing rate and high amplitude neurons. Um, and so you can see in the firing rate that there are often kind of peaks which correspond to around layer five in the cortex. Um, and also in the hippocampus in like the CA1 and CA3 regions. Cool, so I will now stop sharing that and uh, go over to the GUI that I've developed. Can you see that as well? That good? Uh, yes. Yep. Yeah, great, okay. So this is the um, tool. So this is now the tool, yeah, so sorry, quick transition, but this is now the tool that we've developed as part of the IBL that allows you to basically do these steps. So as you can see, I took most of the props from my presentation from this tool directly. Um, but once you load in the data, this will be the first kind of display that you come up with. And so the tool is split into like uh, kind of two columns. So on this side, we have what I call the kind of electrophysiology features, which are split into three different columns. So you have these image plots, um, which, and you have a number of different features. So I'll just walk through them. So you have the firing rate, um, you can see the cross correlation with depth. Um, so this shows uh, the amplitude and, of the recording over the duration, amplitude of spikes across the duration of the recording. Um, so this shows the RMS signal of the AP band, so greater than 250 hertz across the duration of the recording. Um, and then you have a similar one that's for the LFP band, so for low frequencies. Um, you also have the power spectrum, so it's between zero and 300 hertz. Of the recording and then we have a number of these cluster plots that basically show the location of your neuron along the probe um, against some so in this case we've got amplitude and the heat map shows the firing rate and on these you can click on the individual clusters to see their cross correlative uh, autocorrelogram sorry and their waveform so that looks like a bad neuron but yeah um, and we also have these line plots uh, so there are a couple of options so you can see the firing rate or the amplitude which is averaged across the recordings um, and then we have. There is a question coming in, mm -hmm. and yeah. you may want to answer it at the end. Um, but th the question is can you clarify what are the input files to this GUI? And if I may add, can, basically, this right now runs on International Brain Laboratory files. What would one have to do to one's data to make it work on this GUI? Um, yeah, so I actually, maybe I can address that at the end, just because yeah, I sure, have some data sets and yeah, okay, great. Um, so yeah, so then here we have just a number of probe plots that kind of show feature overlaid on the geometry of the plot. So we have, yeah, again, different options and we can see the power spectrum in different frequency bands. Basically. Um, and so in the central panel, we have the histology, which shows where basically our probes pass through in the brain and where they've initially been located. Um, so we have on the left-hand side is the one that will scale as you kind of re-reference your uh, channels. And the one on the right will stay the same as it's just kind of used as a reference. In addition, we have these histology images that basically show the slice through the brain and the red shows the location of the initial channels. So you can zoom in and see that at, to begin with, they're all kind of uniformly distributed along this probe. Um, cool. so, Everything on this is based on reference lines that you can basically, that I showed kind of earlier, that you can add by double clicking on the display. So if you double click, you get a reference line on both 
the electrophysiology panel and also the histology panel, and they move independently of each other. And you can use these then to align the two kind of columns. Um, so yeah, so I'll just go through kind of how I would go about aligning this and show you kind of the process that I go through. So the first thing I probably do is to identify the top of thalamus. So I think that would be this border region here that has very um, the end of activity. Um, so I would line that here. And once you're happy with the alignment, you can press this fit button. That will then shift um, shift your regions down. And as you, I think if you look at the um, electrodes, I think I can go back to the previous one. You can see that they've shifted up in the brain as we've brought um, as we kind of made an alignment. Um, so the second thing that I probably do was is to uh, use the dentate gyrus, as I was explaining before, and assign this to the top of the molecular layer in the bottom. So incorporate this area of uh, air and also the dentate gyrus molecular layer. Great. Um, so we can also zoom in on these images and see the reference line that we've placed. So we can see if we're roughly doing the correct thing. So we can see that we've put this first line that's kind of roughly on the border between thalamus and the hippocampus. And actually, we can change the display. So initially, I'm showing the red channel of the histology, but you can also show the green channel of the histology, um, the kind of CCF template that we're aligning to, and also the kind of annotation label. So we can see that indeed our first one is kind of at the border of uh, hippocampus. Uh, sorry, thalamus, uh, which makes sense. Um, so then, the second thing I probably do is to then align the second dentate gyrus to this quiet area here. Um, and we can see the scaling factor. We've, so this central comment here shows the scaling factor that we've applied locally to all of the regions. So that's kind of like shown as a heat map that has a color bar here. And you can also hover over a region. So here and then in the title, sorry, it's more but in the title here, it will tell you the scale factor that you've applied locally to that region. So in this case, we've stretched that by 1.23 and the one below we've compressed by around a scale factor of 0.9 or so. Um, yeah, so I think the next thing that I would probably align would be, I think I'd identify this high firing rate region here to be the layer five in the visual cortex. Um, so what I would do is just kind of roughly locate this to around the center of that and apply a fit. And then we can see we've actually compressed uh, or stretched the electrodes quite a bit. How um, much, so what, how much? So, so by what factor do you think you ended up stretching? So overall, we stretch it by a factor of 0.9, so okay. 10%. And locally, up to 20%, we've stretched it or scaled wow. it. So yeah. if you don't do this, you might be off by quite a bit of factor. Yeah, um, so I think, yeah, just going through this is some sanity checks or some things that I often look for is, for example, at the top of the probe, we have kind of a quiet area where we, it looks like our probe is kind of out of the brain as we're not recording anything. And if we zoom in on this holiday, we can see that now we have a few of the electrodes outside of the brain, which seems to make sense with what we're seeing in the alignment. Um, another thing is, so where we place this kind of layer of um, white matter fibers. If we go into one of these, um, we can see that we're seeing these kind of positive spike axonal um, firing rates. So it looks like we've kind of correctly identified where that region is. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I'll just go through a few other useful tools that you can do in this. So there's just a few, um, you can basically if you want to get rid of the lines temporarily, you can just like toggle them on and off. Um, if you want to uh, just look at the histology without the channels, you can just hide those. And there's all these different options. Um, um, yeah, we only have yeah. a couple of minutes. Okay, sorry, yeah. I'll so do you wrap want up. To, yeah. If you have a wrap up and also yeah. you tell people how to use this tool with their own data, that would be super helpful. Yeah, so, yeah. so sorry, once you're done with the alignment, you can then upload basically, and it will then uh, record all of your channels in just a JSON file. So you basically have your channel number, your location in 3D space, and then the brain region and the brain region ID that's been assigned to it. Um, so at the moment, uh, I'm using this just from a local set of files that I've 
so this is completely independent of the IBL data infrastructure. So this is just done offline on a local file system that I have on my computer. Um, so there's a number of uh, yeah, file inputs that it requires. Um, and I have, um, so as part of, I've prepared a couple of data sets that users can look through. And um, there's also instructions of how to run this in this offline mode. And so that will show you the data kind of sets that you need to view. And I've also developed a script that basically can take the output from Killersort and prepare all of the data files for you in the correct format that can be then read into the, this um, alignment GUI. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the stage where it's at at the moment. Great, if I can just add something. So that the 10% <laughs> scaling, um, what this is really accounting for is what's presumably a difference in the physical size of this mouse's brain relative to the physical size of the average mouse brain across the, across the 1600 mice that were averaged um, to get the atlas. And so, you know, if your mouse is a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger, that's where this 90% this shift and the sort of slope of the purple line in the bottom right um, relative to the diagonal um, is coming from. Um, and so that, well, that's, it, why, well, that's why it's important to do this, this step, I think. It, it comes um, from that, but it can also come from the fact that whatever you have done to obtain the image on the right, top right might have shrunk the brain or deformed it, right? Uh, you're fixing the brain or things like that. Well, not quite, because you, you de-warped your, so you, yes, yes, your brain will have warped when you did the histology, but then you you warped it back to the Allen Atlas. True. And so it's really okay. a comparison of the of the, of the the live brain, which is your data on the left, versus the Allen Atlas. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I guess, let me add just one other thing is that, um, uh, it's it's not quite coincidence that uh, Maya was our last speaker here and finishing this up because actually I think this GUI is um, not just a great and very useful last step in the uh, histology pipeline, but it's also probably the best way to generate a bunch of really useful plots to sanity check your data and check the data quality of your data and um, see what kinds of noise sources you might have or um, uh, where you have good neurons, etc. Um, and I think for that reason, it's really useful to use this GUI just to get overview of um, the quality of your data. Great. Um, Mayo, do you want to wrap up or you, so go back to your presentation or you are you? Yeah, sorry, I, yeah. that was all I had. Um, so okay. I think there are a couple of data sets that are available. Um, I don't know if you have the link already um, in the install instructions. We'll, we'll publish them. Okay, so, great. Mayo, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, I think you've answered the questions, but I see more coming. So it'd be great if you could look at the Q&A. You can stop your video if you want. You can mm -hmm. look at the Q&A and if you could answer it um, uh, by typing. Uh, 